Hi everyone, I'm Grant Price and I'd like to welcome you to the Avalanche Awareness Webinar. Thanks so much for joining me this evening. I'm excited to be here and be talking about snow and avalanches a bit. Our ski season was cut short, so this is going to be my close to the season and maybe also the start of thinking about next year. <clears throat> All right, the plan for this evening is I'm gonna talk briefly about my background and path through avalanche education. And <clears throat> then I'm gonna give you a tool that you can take with you after this webinar to hopefully guide you in gaining more understanding of avalanches. Or um, if you have prior experience, I think it's a great resource for just organizing what you're thinking about um, in general with avalanches or on a daily basis. As we're going through the avalanche data triangle, we're gonna unpack kind of the nuts and bolts that make up avalanches. And then we're gonna see that content applied and watching the know before you go video tutorial. After that, I'm gonna give you some resources to go forth with. Um, those are also gonna come out in the post webinar email. So you'll have access to all those URLs. And then finally, I'm gonna do questions. If at any point during the webinar you have a question, you can go ahead and click on the Q&A button and then type that question in and submit it. And at the end of the session, I'm gonna answer those in the order that they come in. Also, if uh, you wanna ask verbally, you can click the raise your hand button at the end of the session and I can call on you and unmute your mic and uh, we can chat live. With that, I highly encourage Questions. I think that's a, a great way to learn and something we see in avalanche education is that we're not always going to be able to give you the answers. However, we can oftentimes help you ask the right questions. So uh, a bit about me. <clears throat> I'm from Virginia where about the only thing that slides when it snows are cars off the road. And during the warm months, I'm down here rock climbing in Virginia, West Virginia, and North Carolina. And for the winter, I seek a snowpack. So I either go up to New Hampshire or out to Utah. Beyond uh, <clears throat> the rock climbing uh, on snow, I'm on skis, and then I ice climb and do some alpine climbing. You know, my first exposure to avalanche um, hazard was really as a kid skiing in a Western resort. And at that point, I knew that, you know, there was such a thing as an avalanche and I, you know, knew there was explosive mitigation going on. And I saw the, the signs for unexploded ordinances. And, you know, I don't really know uh, <clears throat> at that point that I really grasped the severity of that. Um, but past that, my next exposure really was my first ice climbing trip to the Adirondacks of New York. Um, we had gone up to Keene Valley and had been climbing um, in Keene and Lake Placid area in, in between. And one day we had our sights set on climbing Chapel Pond Slab. In the photo here, it's this big snowy path. And it's mostly ice, but at the top there's a pocket of snow. And we knew from guidebook descriptions that there's some potential um, for it to avalanche, and it does occasionally. So the, the day of, we drove in on the road. You can see Chapel Pond slab, this little white bit at the bottom. The road runs right through the valley and comes in behind this bench of terrain. And so we parked, jumped out of the truck, and my climbing partners and I looked up at it and <clears throat> kind of all expressed, yeah, there's snow up there. This thing could slide, and we you know, basically silently just accepted that risk and, you know, um, in complete ignorance, just blissfully went about climbing and we got lucky, um, nothing bad happened. But after that, um, I became pretty intrigued with learning about avalanches and being able to manage that risk in the mountains. So back in Virginia during the warm months, I got my hands on some text, um, one of which was Bruce Tremper's Staying Alive in Avalanche Terrain. This is an older edition. The uh, new one has a blue cover to it. And basically went cover to cover. And at that point I was really overwhelmed. Um, it's 
quite the comprehensive book. Um, it really would probably best serve somebody after taking a uh, level one course. Um, and then really the, the depth of it goes all the way up to forecasting. <clears throat> after that, um, winter came around and made my way back to New England and got a level one avalanche course under my belt. Came out of that feeling um, probably uh, more intimidated and afraid than I was before. <clears throat> so tried to start doing some conservative ski tours and alpine climbs with the avalanche hazard. And uh, through being conservative and you know, quite a bit of luck, I would say, uh, made it through that season, went in, took a level two course the next year, and um, then ended up out west for a few seasons, um, got more education, um, went and did a instructor training with ARI, which is the American Institute of Avalanche Research and Education. Um, they've provided all the courses that I've done, and then they're also the largest provider of avalanche courses in the U.S., while I was out west, I um, also did the AMJ ski guide course and then spent time ski patrolling and uh, doing mechanized ski guiding. Um, the last few years I've been in the Northeast um, guiding backcountry skiing, ice climbing, and, and teaching courses. So up next for me is uh, doing the ARI course leader uh, training. And then uh, beyond that, I'd like to do more AMJ programs as well as um, maybe do the Canadian um, level one and level two courses. So. It's, it's really a lifelong learning progression. You know, with Avalanche Ed, whether it's a course or video, there, there's always the fear factor, right? The, uh, the grim numbers of how serious these things are. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on this. We'll, we'll get a taste of it in a moment in the um, No Before You Go video. But um, just a very broad statistic here. In the US, um, on average, we have 27 fatalities per winter um, based on the last 10 winters. And you can see in the graph here from Colorado Avalanche Information Center that you know, things have significantly grown into the early 2000s. And you know, I think you can contribute a lot of that just to the growth of backcountry travel and recreation. And then some of these spiked years um, you can hypothesize that those were based upon um, <clears throat> snowpack and weather, what uh, Mother Nature yielded for us. That being said, in the last few years, the numbers are starting to decrease. Um, that's, of course, given that um, backcountry recreation is on the up. So I'd like to attribute um, that to education. I think we're going in the right direction there. This is the avalanche data triangle. <clears throat> Neat thing about this piece of, uh, or this graphic is that really everything we know about avalanches can fit into one of these categories. The original <clears throat> graphic was just the triangle and then I've added in rescue. We're gonna start first by looking at terrain. Terrain's quite significant in that we have the most control of it. We can choose if we're in or outside of avalanche terrain. One of the biggest determinants of avalanche terrain is slope angle. Is it steep enough to slide? The avalanches that cause the most problem are slab avalanches. We'll talk more about those in a moment, but they're occurring in slope angles between 30 and 45 degrees generally. Sure, there's the potential for a slide, um, in the upper 20s as well if you had a really unstable snowpack or if the slide initiated in steeper terrain and then ran into that lower angle terrain um, but generally 30 and above above 45 degrees we do have avalanches they're just not slabs they're oftentimes loose avalanches um, specifically loose dry avalanches like the ones you see in movies chasing free skiers um, those happen routinely in that steeper terrain <clears throat> And while they can be consequential if they knock you off your feet, they prevent snow from building up and giving us slab avalanche problems. So now we're looking down a slope beyond the angle. Other factors we want to be considering are whether there are anchors on the slope, trigger points, or terrain traps. Anchors are things like densely spaced trees or rocks that haven't been fully covered by snow, things that can hold the snowpack together. 
Trigger points are going to be just the opposite. These are spots where there's more force going into the snowpack and we're more likely to trigger a slide from. These can be trees and rocks. And you know, how do you tell the difference between trees and rocks being anchors or trigger points? It's a really frequent question. With trees, if they're dense enough that you can't comfortably ski or ride through them, they're going to be more like anchors. If they're open enough that you can ski through there and have some fun and rip turns, then they're going to be trigger points. <clears throat> Other trigger points, you can have a cornice, um, snow that's coming off of a ridge line that collapses and then triggers the slope below it. Um, cliffs, <clears throat> there's shallow snow around the, the base of those. It's a spot where our force can go deeper into the snowpack more easily and affect a weak layer. And then terrain traps. Um, if we are in an avalanche, <clears throat> terrain traps are going to amplify the consequences. These work in two forms, either by causing you to be buried more deeply, or it's going to take more time before you can be dug up, or <clears throat> they produce trauma. So being raked into trees, pushed into rocks, over cliffs, um, things like that. So looking at this piece of terrain, from straight on here, it's hard to tell slope angle. That being said, you know, this doesn't look that extreme and it is actually steep enough to avalanche. Towards the top here, this is uh, kind of upper 30s and then mid 30s. In terms of <clears throat> trigger points, we've certainly got some sole trees there and some sparsely placed ones. These would also serve as terrain traps. If you initiated a slide up high here and then were caught and carried, you could get raked into these. Down at the bottom, this is a quite short section of terrain. The valley floor is right here and there's a road through there. So a bit of an abrupt transition from slope to flat, um, a spot where debris could pile up and bury you a little bit more deeply. And then there are some lower angle options here. Things are lower angle over here. And then we do see some trees that are dense enough to be anchors. These here are kind of on the uh, fence. They're more so trigger points. So now let's talk about the snowpack. <clears throat> really what we're worried about in the snowpack is <clears throat> weak layers. Where those come from are differences in layers that we get in the snowpack through seasonal storm events, and then the interfaces in between those layers. What that all boils down to is, do we have layers of strong snow versus layers of weak snow? And significant to this is the recipe for a slab avalanche. Slab avalanche is composed of a cohesive unit of snow, the strong snow, then sitting over top of a weak layer, all resting on a bed surface, something that it can slide down the mountain on. Then all we need is a trigger to fail that weak layer, cause a fracture to propagate, and then send that cohesive layer of snow, the slab, down the mountain. With that, we don't just have slab avalanches. Um, in the United States, we use nine different avalanche problems or characters to describe what kind of avalanche hazard we're expecting in the mountains. Forecasters use these in bulletins to convey this information. So there's nine of them, and the way that I try to remember them is with two, five, and two. The first two are loose snow avalanches, dry and wet. <clears throat> Again, the dry is the one that's chasing the uh, free skier in the film. The wet one is um, a loose snow avalanche you're going to find on a warm day, maybe uh, if you're near freezing temperatures on a solar aspect or um, with rain. And these problems don't cause uh, a whole lot of damage. Um, the concern is if you're in consequential terrain and they can sweep you off your feet, or if they run and then step down and trigger a larger slab avalanche. Now on to our five slabs. <clears throat> Storm slabs, it's kind of in the name there, an instability that's formed due to new snow. Wind slabs, 
what the wind does is it creates that cohesive unit of snow by picking up snow that's available for transport. And then while it's in the air, it takes those snow grains and grinds them up, makes them more rounded. And then when they're deposited, they're able to rapidly form strong bonds with their neighboring grains and we get the slab. The difference between that wind slab and then the snow that was underneath it creates the instability. Then moving on to persistent slabs and deep persistent slabs. These are the ones that <clears throat> account for the most um, fatalities and major accidents. What a persistent slab is, is when we have the weak layer that forms and then hangs out. They can produce avalanches for days, weeks, or even months. These grains are specific. Um, on an avalanche course, you're going to hear about facets, depth hoar, buried surface hoar. Those are some examples of persistent grains. The difference between the persistent slab and the deep persistent slab is just that the deep slab is going to be over a meter and a half or even down at the uh, base of the snowpack. So it's going to produce a much higher consequence avalanche. A lot of times you'll hear forecasters describe these as low probability, high consequence, right? The um, <clears throat> Weak layer is low in the snowpack, so it's hard for our um, pressure bulb as humans to touch that. But if we do, if we find maybe a, a trigger point and initiate one, um, it could be quite catastrophic. The last slab is a wet slab. We're going to find these oftentimes during the springtime or if we get a midwinter warm up or big rain event. That's where a unit of snow. <clears throat> it becomes warm and wetted, and then the bed surface that it's sitting on um, is also lubricated, and um, we'll get a wet slab. The last two avalanches are cornice and glide. A cornice can be an avalanche by definition if it falls off and then uh, runs down the slope, but the way these are formed, if you look at the graphic here, is by wind launching snow off of angular bits of terrain like a ridge line and basically <clears throat> forming a sculpted wind slab off the ridge. They hang out, um, create shadows here you can see. And we're concerned about, you know, breaking one of these off and going for a ride with it, but it can also be a trigger point. If this collapses, it could fail a slab down below it, which might likely be a, a wind slab and create a larger avalanche. Lastly, glide avalanches, um, something you're going to see in the springtime. It's where our whole snowpack, which during the winter is composed of various layers, becomes homogenous. It turns into one unit of snow and then it starts to move down the slope. Initially, it's going to be pretty slow. You oftentimes see a big crack going across the slope. It starts out really small and opens up. And then when it's good and ready, the whole thing slides down. So those are nine avalanche problems. <clears throat> I've placed weather at the bottom of the triangle here because it really makes up our snowpack. There's four different weather effects on the snowpack, wind, rain, temperature, and sun. You might think that temperature would be a big player. It is, however, wind actually um, does quite a number. Wind has the ability to completely remove snow from one slope and then maybe deposit it on another slope. Through that motion, it also changes the snow grains, right? It creates cornices, wind slabs, etc. Then there's rain. Rain adds a tremendous amount of weight to the snowpack rapidly. And then that free water also can break down bonds as it moves through the snow. Temperature impacts both the surface of the snow as well as within the snowpack. On the surface, it does things like creates crust, um, melts the snow, creates free water. And then within the snowpack, it drives the processes that cause those persistent weak layers as well as the absence of a temperature gradient can help remove those instabilities. Sun, very similar to temperatures, impacts the top of the snowpack as well as um, solar radiation has the ability to penetrate into the upper bits of the snowpack. This is a clip from uh, 
some of my best New Hampshire weather caught on film from last season. Wait for it. Okay, so in the middle of the triangle here, triggers. Um, some of the best triggers for avalanches are humans, um, climbers, skiers, riders, snowmobilers, really anyone. Avalanches can also be triggered naturally. Say the wind deposits a large amount of snow on a slope, that could create enough force on that weak layer to cause it to fail. Then there's the human factor. <clears throat> The reason we have avalanche risk is because we have humans in avalanche terrain. You know, if <clears throat> an avalanche ran in the mountains and no one, no one was around to hear it, you know, would it make it sound, <clears throat> excuse me, would it make a sound? With that, as humans, we're disposed to human error and human biases. That coupled <clears throat> with the reason we're out in the mountains to recreate sets us up for being a risk to ourselves out there. So lastly, rescue. <clears throat> the reality is, is that if you're fully buried, the odds of surviving are not good. Um, <clears throat> the statistics around a 50% chance. So with that, your best defense is a good offense. Try to avoid being in an avalanche in the first place. If you are in one though, you want to have the rescue skills dialed. So you need to get gear, you need to learn how to use it, <clears throat> and then practice it. And with practice, the skills are going to get rusty, right? You're not using this stuff on a regular basis, hopefully. So it's important to do this at the beginning of every season and then throughout the season. You know, I do avalanche rescue practice on a weekly basis, teaching courses, and even at the end of an eight hour rescue course day, I still feel like, wow, I could spend the entirety of tomorrow just practicing rescue. So quite a bit of information there. <clears throat> the takeaway I would say here is the triangle graphic. I think that's an awesome, way to organize what we know about avalanches um, and can help guide you in learning about them going forward. And then when you actually get to the point of applying this stuff, you can use it to a degree for risk management. If you think about the legs of the triangle and trying to remove one of those or more than one, that can significantly reduce your risk. So for example, if we have an unstable snowpack, we can stay out of avalanche terrain to manage the risk. So with that, we're gonna see some of that material now in the Know Before You Go video.
Avalanches don't discriminate. You know, they're equal opportunity killers. They affect everyone in the mountains. And whether you're snowboarding, skiing, snowmobiling, sledding, cross-country skiing, hiking, snowshoeing, extreme snow angeling. If you live close to snow-covered mountains, you need to know about avalanches. It really just goes with the territory. Everyone's really excited. A fresh storm had just come in and dropped over two feet of new snow. It was blasting rock and roll music. And, and you get to the exit point. So Mike was finishing his ski cut. And instead of waiting, he just charged right into the slope. And in his first turn, a huge rooster tail of powder came up. And everyone in the group started cheering, yeah, go get it. And then in his third turn, we saw the slope just start to crumble completely. Your heart just sinks because you realize we just screwed up big time. Even though, you know, you've got this organized rescue and you've got people getting to them within 15 minutes, you don't always get that luck that you're going to get down there and, and everything's going to work out all right. Some of the medical staff initiated CPR, but um, about 40 minutes after the avalanche had occurred, they had ruled his time to death. After the accident, when we were driving home, I thought those three turns, that wasn't what it Avalanche accidents are so tragic because they affect the entire winter community. I've personally experienced what it feels like to lose friends in an avalanche accident, the devastating ripple effects it has on everybody in the community. What is an avalanche? There's a lot of different kinds of avalanches, but the kind that causes the most trouble are what we call dry slab avalanches. A slab avalanche is like a monster in a horror film. It lies underneath the perfect facade. It's ice and powder. It's just waiting for a trigger to come along, like you, to collapse that weak layer, and then that collapse just goes outwards in all directions. The slope just shadows like a pane of glass. There's no escape. It rockets down the hill, bounces you off the trees and rocks on the way down, comes you over a cliff. I mean, does any of that sound dangerous to you? I was not aware, and I did not comprehend the dangers that were out there that day. When I triggered the avalanche, it wrapped me up immediately. Not a second later, I was hit in the back with what well, felt like a truck. Didn't even have a chance. I ended up laying there in the snow with two broken femurs and my broken left arm for between seven and eight hours. Had a total of four surgeries, still in therapy three days a week, trying to learn how to walk again and get use of my body again. Avalanches are very violent events. One out of four people are killed by the trauma of hitting trees and rocks on the way down. And after they tumble you to the bottom, then the avalanche debris instantly sets up like concrete. You can't just pop off out of you. Somebody else has to get you out of the snow. Really fun day. It was beautiful powder snow, blue skies, sunshine, just cloud shots, nothing extreme. We were trying to get gnarly or anything. Came around the corner, dropped in. It was great. And then saw crests shoot out all around me. I did see like the sky for a moment and then just a whole wave of snow went over my face. So I had like a moment of, ah, maybe I can just punch through to the top. And as soon as I tried to move at all, I realized that I couldn't even bend a finger. The most important avalanche skill to learn is how to read avalanche terrain, which mainly means judging slope steepness. Almost all avalanches occur on slopes steep of 30 degrees, but you know what? When the snow is sketchy, we can still have lots of fun playing on mellower terrain. We just want to make sure we're not on, underneath, or even connected to steeper slopes. The bottom line is the only time we should even consider getting into steep terrain is when we have safe avalanche conditions. Some slopes are going to produce much worse outcomes should they avalanche than other slopes. For example, if you're above a bunch of trees, rocks, cliffs, or you're going to get washed into a lake or a gully, 
the outcome of getting caught in an avalanche like that is much worse than if you're in some big wide open meadow. The difference between riding in a ski resort and riding in the backcountry is really night and day. In a ski resort, we use explosives and terrain closure to minimize the risk of avalanches to our customers. But outside the ski area, once you step just two feet over that rope line, you're in a totally different environment. Anybody that's going into the backcountry or thinking about going off piece at a resort really needs to understand that it's a totally uncontrolled environment. There isn't any ski patrol, uh, they're not bombing or doing any avalanche control. It can be really dangerous. So essentially you need to be, you know, your own avalanche expert. So a nine out of 10 avalanche fatalities, they're triggered by the victim or somebody in the victim's party, which is actually good because it's not like getting struck by lightning. We have a choice. That means if we learn something about avalanche, we can avoid getting caught in avalanche. Avalanche safety can seem totally overwhelming, you know, but there is a systematic step-by-step -step process that can keep you alive in avalanche training. Just knowing five basic things can prevent most avalanche accidents. Get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. Everyone who goes in the backcountry avalanche terrain needs basic avalanche rescue gear. You need an avalanche transceiver, a shovel, and a probe. And you need to practice a lot to know how to use all of this gear because your friend only has about 15 minutes to live buried beneath the snow. A lot of people also use an inflatable avalanche airbag backpack that will help them rise to the top of avalanche debris. How well does this avalanche rescue gear actually work? Well, for one out of four people killed in an avalanche, they're gonna die from trauma. They're gonna hit trees or rocks on the way down the slope. So avalanche rescue gear isn't gonna do anything for them. The rest of them die from asphyxia, from breathing their own carbon dioxide underneath the snow. But it doesn't have to be that way. If everyone wore an avalanche airbag backpack, as well as an avalanche transceiver, two out of three people who die from asphyxia would still be alive. The bottom line is avalanche rescue gear will only save about half of us. But in order to stack the odds in my favor, I make sure to never go skiing as sledders, we travel in the backcountry a little bit different than skiers, but I still need to have my avalanche gear attached to my body. Having it attached to my tunnel does me no good. I get separated from my sled, I get separated from my safety gear. If your buddies that you ride with don't have the training and the equipment, don't let them ride with you. So now that you've got the gear, you've got to get the training. So when you take an avalanche course, you're basically getting keys to a whole new world. You'll learn about avalanche terrain, snowpack, weather, rescue. Essentially, you're trying to take the guesswork out of travel in avalanche terrain. As a first timer just coming in, it's really important to take the right classes and gain all the knowledge before going out in the backcountry. Getting the training isn't just taking an avalanche class. It's a great start but really it's about practicing what you've learned. You know, make it a ritual, make it fun. You know, throw down some lunch money and do some time drills. You know, when it comes down to it, it's about having your friends back and knowing that they have yours. Not just the skiers that need to get the training because sleds are taking us further into the backcountry. So we really need to bring our avalanche skills up to the level of our mm -hmm. skills. Mm -hmm. Next, you gotta get the forecast. These avalanche forecasters are pros. They're gonna tell you everything you need to know. They're gonna tell you about the snowpack. They're gonna tell you about the weak layers. They're gonna tell you where avalanches are gonna happen, where you can likely avoid avalanches. All that information is one click away. To get the avalanche forecast, visit avalanche.ca in Canada or avalanche.org in the States. Before I even get on the snow, I check my local avalanche advisory. So take the time, get the forecast. When you're traveling in the backcountry, you've got to get the picture. What's that mean? It means pay attention. 
Look for recent avalanches. Listen for cracking or lumping that's taking place around you. Look for recent storm snow, wind loaded snow. Look for rapid thawing. If you look for all these things, you're gonna get the picture. You're gonna be a safer backcountry skier. You get out of the harm's way in the backcountry by first avoiding suspect slopes and terrain to begin with. We don't want to regroup in avalanche paths and we don't want to stop or regroup in runout zones. Some of my best advice I can give you is when we're out hill climbing and there's a bunch of us, don't go park right at the bottom in the avalanche path. Park on the outside, stay out of harm's way. Just like you ski a slope one person at a time, once you're at the bottom, get out of the way of the avalanche path. We want you to realize that avalanches are dangerous, but you can avoid getting caught in them. First, get the gear. But then you've got to get the training before ever going into the backcountry. Next, always check your local avalanche forecast so you can anticipate the given avalanche conditions for the day. You can get the picture by looking for the obvious signs of instability. And you'll be getting out of harm's way by managing your exposure to potentially hazardous slopes. A lot of times when people watch us in the films, all they see is the action of us shredding these big lines. But what you don't see is the behind the scene, all the prep that goes into making sure that the slopes are safe, checking out the snowpack, waiting for snow to settle, doing all the homework it takes to safely rip the big lines. All this information is great and incredibly practical. But at the end of the day, if you feel uneasy about something, it's about having the courage to say no and walk away. The mountain isn't going anywhere. It doesn't matter if you've made thousands of good calls. All it takes is one bad call, and that's one too many. Some days the mountains are screaming, get out of here. And some days the mountains are going, come on in. It's time to party. Okay, so where to go next? Um, during the off season, there are a lot of great online resources you can get to. Um, if you just Google no before you go or use this um, URL there, you can get to the video we just saw as well as some online tutorials that um, no before you go has available. The Airy website, um, there's gonna be a directory on there of course um, providers and courses um, throughout the country. Avalanche.org, this is kind of the um, Forest Service government um, avalanche website. It shows you a map of all the different forecasting centers in the US. And then they have a ton of resources on there. One of the things that I quite frequently um, use is their um, avalanche encyclopedia. So if there's a snow term you're not familiar with, you can look it up on there. And then this is the link to Bruce Tremper's um, new edition of Staying Alive in Avalanche Terrain there. 
And like I said, um, <clears throat> this will come out to you in the post webinar um, email, or if uh, you didn't put a uh, email address in there, maybe take a moment and just grab a screenshot of it. So with that, we're gonna go to questions. <clears throat> Got one um, question here already from Patrick. Um, I have done a ARI 1 for the MJ Alpine Guide course. Um, do you re recommend doing the ARI 2 or Pro? Um, so for the <clears throat> MGA progression, you're ultimately going to need the Pro 1 to get into um, a lot of the guide track programs. And before you go in to that Pro 1, you're gonna need to do the one day rescue course if you haven't already. I would recommend doing the level two, um, maybe to help prepare you to go into the Pro 1, especially if you don't have a lot of time um, on snow. If you know, you're know you a seasoned avalanche professional and uh, you're just kind of going through the ARI programs, I would say go straight to uh, the pro pro one. Um, another reason to maybe do the, the level two um, as a professional would be to familiarize yourself with that content, how the course is conducted um, in the event that you're going to teach them in future. Once an event happens, is it safer to go into that area or is there such a thing as a secondary avalanche that could cause harm? Yeah, this is a great question from <clears throat> Jason. So <clears throat> once a slide occurs, it really depends on what's hanging out above the top of the avalanche, um, what we refer to as the crown line. So if we don't have a lot of snow up there um, or the slope is relatively low angle, um, <clears throat> there's a very reasonable decision to be made there to go in and go down the bed surface um, of what's just slid. However, there can be cases where you have hang fire snow above that crown line that is um, still primed to, to go that could come down on top of you. Um, and oftentimes a more concerning thing is, do you have an adjacent path that could run and go into the runout zone, uh, maybe where you're going to uh, try to conduct a, a rescue. Yeah, does anyone have additional questions? Um, you can keep typing those in, or if you'd like to um, ask verbally, um, just click the raise your hand button and I can uh, turn on your microphone. Oh, nice. If an avalanche happens in a closed section of Mount Washington, does it make a noise? That was good. Um, <clears throat> I think what it really would probably do is uh, make a hole in your wallet. Um, my understanding is the fee is $5,000 for an individual and then $10,000 for um, an organization recreating in closed sections of uh, the White Mountains National Forest. <clears throat> it's pretty expensive powder. And there's not even a helicopter involved. Okay, question from Casey here. What are some of the heuristic traps to be cognizant of, particularly as a novice? You know, <clears throat> this is a, a pretty broad subject. Um, <clears throat> guess in terms of what to maybe focus the most attention on, it to me almost depends on who you are and a bit uh, about yourself. I guess one of the common things we see is people overestimating their abilities. Um, <clears throat> you can become a professional, you know, level or expert level skier and rider um, within the um, ski area, but then 
it's hard to flip the switch and recognize that you're a novice to backcountry travel. And uh, for that reason, um, see people oftentimes get in over their heads. Um, <clears throat> what would be another one? <clears throat> the fact that backcountry travel is somewhat social um, is another presentation. Uh, so that could be maybe seeing where other people have skied and then thinking, okay, that's a reasonable decision to make and then going right to that terrain or um, maybe being pressured with, from within your group, um, you know, wanting to be accepted with the people you're out with um, or maybe a bit of, of peer pressure. And then of course, um, today we're, we're on Instagram, right? Like I kind of joke, but I'm, mostly serious, why do um, I even go skiing and climbing? It's for the Instagram photos. Um, so there's quite a bit of pressure on us um, to make the decisions that we're making. Yeah, I apologize, kind of a uh, um, very like spotty answer there, um, but I, off the, the cuff, don't think I can really open up like every one of, of uh, the heuristics that I would advise somebody on like a level one course to be thinking about. All right, question from Mark. Let's say I'm on an expedition and we're sitting out bad weather at base camp um, for three days. What should be done over those three days to better understand what avalanche conditions might actually be like um, when you can climb again. Amount of snow over that period of time, temps, etc. Yeah, <clears throat> I would want to be collecting as much data during that storm event as possible. If this is somewhere where you have um, communications, you could be maybe looking at weather forecast, um, remote weather stations, if you have um, digital data on a cell phone, if not, think about um, trying to get a call out with a uh, sat phone um, and get somebody to read your information off of weather stations. Um, sometimes when I'm out of cell phone service, I'll use a um, satellite communicator, a Garmin inReach um, to message someone that's in the front country and get weather reports. And then beyond um, you know, getting weather data remotely like that, um, I would try to set up you know, a pseudo snow study plot in your camp just to try to track um, the amount of snow that you're, you're getting, um, go out, make some daily observations, see what the winds are doing at Ridgeline, things like that. Um, given you know, if um, you're on an expedition, chances are you're, you're somewhere where you may not get the most representative um, snow study plot due to wind exposure, things like that. But um, yeah, I would say more data is, is better than um, none. Okay, from Dennis, where have you been guiding such recreating where avalanche risk has been most difficult to mitigate? Um, understanding that not going is always an option. What's the easiest? Um, <clears throat> in a lot of ways, I think that New England is um, one of the hardest places to um, guide and recreate. And it's just because the terrain is pretty confined. You don't have a lot of options and the places that people frequently want to go are the west side of Mount Washington, for example, and um, excuse me, the uh, east side of Mount Washington in uh, the wintertime, um, at least in New Hampshire. And so with that, you're going into quite steep, um, you know, it's certainly not simple terrain, but I wouldn't say it's all the way at complex or very complex but it's challenging. 
And with that, you're going right to the avalanche problem. You know, we typically have wind slabs up there that are um, forming on east facing terrain. Um, so yeah, not a whole lot of options. And um, I think that makes it, makes it difficult as well as um, beyond the avalanche problem, you're dealing with the New England weather during the winter. Um, what about the easiest? I, I would say <clears throat> that I've been Utah just in that you get a lot of terrain options. Um, I've also found um, like on siting stuff in Idaho to, to be pretty reasonable. Um, again, just because you get so many options in terrain, you can find low angle stuff to set your up track in, and then you can have an egress that's low angle, um, and then some options to conservatively step out into to steeper terrain. So this is from Jason. What can one do if caught in a slide to better their chances, assuming they're not wearing an airbag? Um, does swimming actually help? <clears throat> so, you know, the first thing to do if you trigger something, you see the um, snow slope shattering around you is to start making people in your party aware of that, right? Yell avalanche, get everyone's attention on you so that they can watch where you go and establish a point last scene. As that's happening, <clears throat> before the slide starts to really gain some speed, see if you can escape it. See if you can prevent yourself from being caught. Um, sliding off to the uh, side of the slope, getting to high terrain, grabbing onto stuff. Um, another thing to do is if you're on foot, you know, anchor into the slope where you're at, trying to not go down with the snow. So use your ice axe, um, kick your feet in. And then if you do find yourself moving with the, the slow slope and you're, you're caught, um, <clears throat> you want to ditch your gear, get rid of, um, ski poles, skis, keep your backpack on. That's going to provide protection to you and it's going to keep your um, avalanche rescue gear with you. Of course, if you had an airbag, you want to trigger that really early on as soon as you're seeing that um, slope shattered. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, try to stay on top of the, the snow. I, I would recommend um, fighting and, and swimming with the exception if you're, you're in a really big avalanche. Um, at that point, you probably need to just try to protect yourself, ball up, um, go down with the slow snow and then as things are starting to slow down then you can make a last ditch effort to try to swim get to the top getting a hand up out of the snow is going to increase your odds of um, being found it's easier to find um, somebody with an extremity out and then uh, you're also going to be closer to the surface if you've swam that last um, instance The question from Mark F, um, can you recommend practice exercises to maintain proficiency after training? Yeah, um, <clears throat> once you go through a course, uh, as I was saying, I, I think it's easy to come out of that feeling that you maybe know less or have less proficiency than uh, when you went into that course. <clears throat> That's pretty common. And what I would first say to do is review everything that was presented during the course. Um, take good notes during the, the program. Um, in the age of smart, smartphones, just take your phone and snap photos of all the slides. Um, so you've got that stuff. And then um, a course manual, go through that cover to cover. Um, on ARI courses, you, you get that course manual. And then you've also um, been provided a pre-course learning activity. So I would go through that again after the course to cement some of those things. <clears throat> and then with um, things out in the field, I'd say use the course content. ARI courses are based upon um, really driving this blue field book that has a risk management framework in it. Um, so just applying that um, beyond the course is going to go a long ways. And then with rescue practice, you really want to set up quality rescue scenarios and try to practice as realistically as you can and as perfectly as you can. 
to get some people together um, <clears throat> and start with just going through a drill at slow pace, get all the details in there. Um, there are rescue checklists that you can uh, find from uh, Avalanche course providers. Airy has one and uh, within their course materials, they actually have very detailed like two page um, evaluation that we use um, on rescue courses to give people feedback. But then you also have those in your field book where you can take them out and uh, practice with other people. So yeah, um, practice perfect and then just Lots of repetition. Cool. Any other questions? Don't see that anyone's um, got a hand up. <clears throat> so I'll hang out um, here for a few more moments to answer questions. I'll check through the chat here, make sure there wasn't anything there that I missed. All right, cool. So last call on questions. <clears throat> okay, so we'll call that a wrap. Once again, thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, it was a lot of fun um, going through the, the webinar with everyone. I appreciate the, the questions. <clears throat> Hope everyone is staying healthy uh, during these times. And I'm certainly looking forward to being out in the mountains with folks um, once things clear up. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good evening. <clears throat>